see if I can do this. I almost want to talk into the microphone, but can't do that. Uh, so I'll try to have a Tom Fryer moving voice. But I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Ed Berger to talk about the Kansas Cosmos here today. He's retired president of Hutch Community College and recent, recently accepted an engagement with the Cosmosphere as the chair of the Revitalization Initiatives in 2014. Dr. Ed Berger earned his Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts degrees from Wichita State University before attaining his Doctorate of Education from Kansas State University, focusing on adult and occupational education. He's a recipient of the Phi Theta Kappa Distinguished College President Award for the Kansas Re Region, as well as a recipient of the Shirley D. Gordon Award of Distinction for a Community College President. <laughs> Under Dr. Berger's charge, Hutchison Community College enjoyed substantial growth and improvement. Noted projects include the creation of the state-of-the-art campus library, the Shears Technology Center, the Richard Smith Science Center, the expansion of the Jackson Dick Parker Student Union, and the complete renovation of Gowan Football Stadium. Through his leadership, Hutchison Community College became not only one of the best community colleges in Kansas, but in the Midwest. Please give a nice rotary welcome to Dr. Ed Berger. <laughs> I bring you greetings from the Hutchinson Rotary Club, uh, it's a club of about probably a very similar size to this, this club. Now, I don't know about, uh, about this club, but we meet uh, the let's see, first, third, and fifth uh, Monday, so it's not a weekly club, so for, for whatever reason. But again, I, I appreciate very much having the opportunity to come and visit with you today. I hope everybody can hear me, okay, I'm going to try to use my educator's voice, uh, and Andrew's going to help me a little bit with my advancing of my slides. But basically, when you look at the Cosmos, how many of you all have been to the Cosmos? Not everybody. So you know, it's a world-class museum, a wonderful world-class museum, has artifacts that just can't imagine being in the central part of, of Kansas. But like most organizations, after you go on for a while, and we have been in existence for about 50 years, you start to look at yourself and say, how can we reinvent ourselves? What can we do differently? <laughs> and first, the first thing you have to look at certainly is your mission. And so that's what we started doing. We looked at the mission of the Cosmosphere. Okay, so what do we do at the Cosmosphere? What do we do better than anything else? And we said, you know, we provide a great deal of inspiration. You go in that lobby and you see an SR-71 hanging from the ceiling. You go downstairs and you see an Apollo 13 capsule. We provide a great deal of inspiration. How can we take that inspiration to the next level? After talking and after looking at everything we're doing, so we can do inspiration, we can inspire innovation through science education while still preserving the and honoring the history of space exploration. So a new direction for us, not really, but a different direction, a different level of emphasis for us at the Cosmosphere. And <clears throat> I have trouble finding my slides here. Andrew? When you look at the, the mm -hmm. artifacts, I, I'm going to have you just advance the artifacts. Okay. When you look at the at the artifacts, so that's a great deal of inspiration in and of itself. I'll just come out. You can certainly appreciate that. But we also have astronauts sitting quite frequently working at the Cosmosphere. This is astronaut Jerry Ross uh, in the Cosmosphere, inspiring a six year old. And, you know, what an opportunity for a young man. Uh, we have a contract with Steve Holland, a native of Salina, a physics prof at KU, is on site frequently, does workshops for our community, does workshops for people out in the area. Uh, we have uh, uh, Jim Lovell in, in, in obviously Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes, uh, the remaining crew members of the Apollo 13. So frequently we have people like that on site making a difference, really making a difference for the Cosmos and for its visitors. Next slide here. But when you look at the impact that the Cosmos had, 
annually we'll have about 105,000 visitors. Now this is not our stadium, I think that's Ohio State Stadium. 105,000 visitors annually. And when you look at those 105,000 visitors, the most important, I think, this is where they come from. About 25% of our visitors will be from out of state or international. We have a tremendous number of internationals that come to the Cosner. We have a tremendous number of people from out of state that come to the Cosner as simply as, as a designation. When I talk about us shifting toward education, it's not like we haven't always done education. We've always done a great deal of education. We've had about 12,000 students a year in camps or in, in field trips. We have about 1,500 students a year in camps. And we looked at that number and said, pretty good. A lot of students were impacting on us. A lot of unified school districts were bringing to the Cosmeter. How can we do it better? And looking at our field trips, we were very concerned that our field trips were becoming kind of repetitive, doing the same thing year in, year out. Kid gets off the bus. Looked around, had a sandwich, go somewhere. How can we do something different? How can we put more rigor in that field trip? How can we structure education and learning so it's a great deal more focus? And then when looking at our camps, we'll have 1,500 students a year in camp. Great students. It's wonderful if, number one, you have a strong interest in science, strong interest in math, and your parents have the wherewithal to send you. So we said, let's be more inclusive. Let's do what we can to bring students in who might have that interest in science or math and just scratch it a little bit and take them to the next level. So that is part of what we're doing. But again, we don't want to forget the fact that this museum is truly unique in the United States. We have the largest collection of space artifacts outside of the Smithsonian. We have the largest collect collection of Soviet artifacts outside of Moscow. Together that provides us the largest international collection of space artifacts in the world. And not only that, but they're incredibly well displayed. This is a Liberty Bell 7 capsule. We worked with the Discovery Channel and rescued that from the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Brought that up from the bottom and restored it. And that <laughs> capsule is on site now until I think the end of December and then it goes to it goes to the Indianapolis Children's Museum it has by the way just come back out of the middle of the spring from Bonn Germany it was over in Bonn Germany for about three or four months over there a great artifact unique artifact something that uh, again it's amazing to find in Central Kansas We've also been recognized as being one of the eight wonders of Kansas. And again, we're the only Smithsonian affiliate in the state of Kansas. The only Smithsonian affiliate in the state of Kansas. We have, that's the Apollo 13 capsule. The Apollo 13 capsule, uh, certainly a, a unique artifact, something that the Cosmosphere restored. And again, we've been recognized as one of the Save of America's Treasures projects. I mentioned we had uh, in August, had Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes uh, on site. Also had the, the ground crew uh, uh, from that mission on site as well. After we finished the restoration of the Apollo 13 capsule, we had Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes on site before we had it glassed in. And we asked them, it's kind of emotional. They hadn't seen that thing since they got down. And we asked them, would you like to get in? Would you like to kind of Jim said, sure, I'd like to do that. Fred Hayes said, nope, spent too much time in that thing. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Go ahead, Jim, knock yourself out. <laughs> as, as we mentioned, artifacts travel the world. We have an exhibit right now that uh, is, in, uh, is in Europe. It's been all through Asia. And uh, we're also getting ready to have global displays uh, throughout uh, this continent. Certainly a, a large part of what we do at the, uh, at the Cosmos Group. And one of the things that people don't really understand and recognize and, and are aware of is our Space Works Division. Our Space Works Division is kind of a byproduct of the Cosmosphere in that it restores and also preserves and builds artifacts for museums all over the world. And 
it is a, a, a really unique component. And it is applied science. We talk a lot about, about applied science. A lot of applied science is happening right there. In fact, we just completed uh, restoring some Apollo engines that were fished up in the bottom of the Atlantic uh, for, uh, for Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com fame. Uh, he had a, has a strong interest in space, brought those engines up, and we preserved those. We didn't re restore them. Uh, we preserved those engines. And they're now probably, some will go to the Smithsonian, some will go out to his museum. We wanted some of that for ourselves, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to keep any of it. So. But when you talk about science, I, I think a, a lot about science is, is maybe overcomplicated. We, we tend to make science more difficult than it should be. And I really like Hubble's definition of science. When he says, equipped with his five senses, man explores the universe around him and calls the adventure science. That's really all it is. And that's what we're trying to emphasize. We're trying to emphasize applied science, technology, engineering, and math at the Cosmic School. And with that, we have a vision, pretty simple vision, to be recognized internationally for excellence and in inspiring learning and excellence through science, technology, engineering, and math. Pretty ambitious, but we're getting very close to being right spot on. The Vice President of Education for the Cosmosphere and the President for the Cosmosphere were invited to present to 600 Chinese mm -hmm. educators. And they are adopting our curriculum for the physics of flight. So when you talk about global, being recognized internationally, we're pretty much there. The, sci the Chinese, by the way, are building 3,000 applied science centers all across that country. That tells you the emphasis they're placing on applied science. So why are we doing this? Why are we going this direction? Why are we looking at applied science, technology, engineering, math? Three reasons. I'll go global to, to local. So the global is, is where we stand internationally in advanced science and advanced math schools. This number says 31 and 24. Those are numbers. I don't know what they mean. Some would say those are very conservative numbers. Well, it's a lot worse than that. So it's like, well, how can we as a cosmosphere impact significantly on those numbers? How can we cause more learning to take place? How can we advance those math and science schools? How can we have a model that can be replicated not only across Kansas, but across the nation, perhaps across the world? So that was step one. The second thing was to take a look at happening in the state of Kansas. A few years ago, the Board of Regents and the legislature put $110 million into KU, K-State, and Wichita State to increase the number of engineering graduates by 56%. Goal being, we want more engineers in Kansas industry. Engineers drive a lot of happiness in your business and industry community. And if you go to those engineering schools today, they'll say, we're hitting our targets. We're right spot on. But they will also follow up and tell you, we're hitting our targets. We're not doing it with Kansas kids. We're doing it with out-of-staters and internationals. Increasingly, internationals are going back to India, China, where they, where they came from, because their job opportunities are also, our immigration policies aren't really friendly to keeping those, those individuals on site. So it's not having the impact that we want it to. Like I said, that kid from Colorado that completes his or her engineering degree at, at K-State or KU or Wichita State, they're probably not going to stay here. They're going to go back home. So it's not helping the blackened beaches of this world. Why could be really central to making that legislation possible? So you got your international perspective, not doing well internationally, test scores. You got the state perspective, we need to do something to fill that pipeline. So K State can talk about getting all those students in their engineering program from right here to Kansas. And the third area of concern, and that is certainly something that impacts on every one of you, is technology technologically sophisticated workforce that 
we're needing today and will become more sophisticated as we move forward. We were down at uh, Spirit Aircraft in August. They said half of their workforce is going to be retiring eligible in the next year or so. They will not replace those people person for person. They'll replace them with technology. And when they replace them with technology, they're going to require a highly skilled worker in that setting and environment. At the height of the recession in Sedgwick County, when you had all those layoffs, all that unemployment, there was a shortage of skilled workers in Sedgwick County. That's a huge concern. I think you've seen that. If you're involved in business, you've seen that. I was at a small manufacturer in central Kansas this week. He said, I'm introducing technology at every turn. I've got eight robotic workers. I went to a small industry a couple years ago, and he said, well, you know, I can't find welders, so I'm going to have to go to a, ro to a robot. He said, it's costing me a hell of a lot of money. So I went to that robotic welder, and guess what? In a very short period of time, he had five robotic welders. But he needed a skilled person to make that happen. So there you have it. Three strong points. International test scores, <clears throat> need for engineering graduates from Kansas, and need for technologically sophisticated workforce. We've got a couple models. One of them is just, uh, as you see right in front of you, it puts education center, puts science, technology, engineering, math, some space, all that part of what we're looking at. But the simple pyramid that we're, you're seeing in front of you is something we've really built our foundation on providing inspiration for that student. We think we can bring that third grader in there and inspire him or her to look at math and science. And we think we can engage them in a hands-on learning activity that'll make a difference for him or her. And then we think that individual, that young person, can take that back to the classroom. And what's the ultimate goal? It's employment. That's what you're looking at, you're looking at jobs. So as such, we've developed grade level specific curriculum for every grade level. So if your son or daughter goes to a field trip at, at the college center, what they're going to experience is going to be different from every grade level. We've got a fifth grade program that centers on, on space junk. They'll see examples of space junk in the museum. They'll have a video documentary on space junk. And you know what their capstone experience is? <coughs> They'll build a space junk collector because those fifth graders are going to have to deal with that problem this next generation. We have a physics supply class. As in the spirit of being more inclusive of our camps, we've got a girls, all girls, <coughs> physics supply class. The capsule experience for that, we take them out to the airport and we put them in the glider. So you had all that theory. Here it is, you're living it now. You can see what lift thrust is all about. High school, we've got something called a Cosmo Crisis. Basically, we have those students do some pre-work, be the Manhattan Project, Hiroshima, do quite a bit of applied math. Uh, teachers uh, bring them in. We, they concentrate more on juniors than anything else. Divide them into groups of nine. They're part of the National Security Council. And we say this part of the state is under nuclear threat. You're part of the National Security Council. You've learned a lot in your school setting. You've got three hours to make a recommendation as to what action the president should take. And then you give a briefing to the president. We have McConnell Air Force Base come in and do a military briefing. We have John Hopkins, Scott General Weather Briefing. We have first responders from Hudson Community College to talk about how you handle crowds, how you, how you evacuate a community. And we have everybody take training on how to give a briefing because everybody should know this. Great experience. We, we didn't even have that finished, but we had three schools. We had Play Center, Pratt, which is on the left side up there. We're doing something similar for uh, Apollo 13 Redux. Question of this one was does technology drive war or does war drive technology? It's pretty simple. For Apollo 13 Redux, how much information do you need to make a decision? And we're doing something similar. We're developing an ag terrorism scenario as well. That ag terrorism scenario has had 
tremendous interest out west as you can imagine. Because they, at least one entity out west, thinks they've already been evicted. Right. And so they then back up here. You know all, what that's all about, the importance of it. So those are some of the directions we're going. And what am I talking to you about? What am I asking you to do? We're asking for Rotary. I've been to Rotary clubs all over the city of Kansas, from Independence and Southeast, Golden and Northwest. I'm asking for a couple of things. Number one, we're asking for your commitment to excellence. You as Rotarians, that's what you're about, your commitment to excellence. We're asking for your commitment to education. You have a wonderful university here. You've got a great tech college, great school system. Commit to that education and learning system. That is key to this country's future. And we are asking you to commit to leadership in that area. Give them support. Give them, give them the needs that they have. Help them with the needs that they have. So they can take that education experience to the next level. And I'm asking for your commitments to the nation's future. That is how important this is. The last thing in the world this nation can stand to have is to be dependent on other countries for human capital. And right now we're somewhat dependent on other countries for energy. We never want to be in a situation where human capital is something we depend on other countries for. So that's my message, my, my message is very simple. It's important, it's vital. I think our nation's future is tied to it. Certainly. Historically, you can see that as well. So with that, I just ask you if you have any questions, anything I can respond to. Yes? The lack of support from our federal government has, has what kind of an impact on the, the, the space program? Uh, the space program? It's really kind of reconfigured. It's being privatized a lot. We're working with some of the private uh, people involved in space travel. Uh, we think it's what space the whole space picture is so different now than it was, you know, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, it was that hotshot jet pilot who was part of the space program. Today it's not. It's a, it's a physicist, it's a chemist, it's a doctor. Those are the people that are part of the space program today. So it doesn't have quite the glimpse, but it has heavy science. And that's what we're telling the people who would like to get involved in that kind of thing. You know, it's not going to be the, the Buck Rogers thing as, as it was back in the day. It's going to be you as an individual learning a lot about something. Other questions? Okay. Okay, I've got one more thing. Okay. Okay, I've got just a fabulous cosmos for account. One you won't find anywhere. <laughs> Unique. And what other Rotary Clubs have done is to have a little auction. And the proceeds for that auction go to Rotary. So that you could probably be an auctioneer, couldn't you? And see what kind of business you can have. <laughs> how about, how, do, you, do you think you know Betty pretty well? <laughs> no, I've known Betty a long time. I knew her when she was a car salesman. That's right. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> the show's fun to say, man. Okay, what's my bid for the cup? Started with fifteen dollars. All goes to Rotary. Here. Got one here. Got twenty. Here. Got twenty. Okay. Got twenty-five. Twenty-five. Here. Here. Okay. Thirty. Thirty. How many twenty-fives do we have? <laughs> thirty. Got thirty over here. Thirty. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. I'll go thirty-five. Thirty-five. Okay. Forty. <laughs> okay, so for 35, but if anybody want to match that, I happen to have another one. <laughs> so if anybody wants to match that bid for 35, you can have this one too. 35? I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> 70 bucks for Rotor. Right. Thank you.